as his ministry on earth began, Jesus entered the wilderness for 40 days and nights of prayer and fasting. It was during this time that Jesus faced temptations. I'm reading verses from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, which describes one of these temptations. Then the devil brought Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. He said, I'll give you all these if you bow down and worship me. Jesus responded, Go away, Satan, because it's written, You will worship the Lord your God and serve only him. The devil left him, and the angels came and took care of him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. What is the greatest or the most important political decision ever made? What would you say? Uh, maybe the decision that launched this nation and declared our independence from Great Britain? I think we'd all say that was an important decision, but was that the most important political decision ever? Maybe it was a decision that... Uh, that put away with slavery and began to address this nation's original sin of racial injustice and oppression that's still a part of American life today. Or maybe it's a decision that gave voting rights to women, or, or you might say it's a decision that we're all facing on November 3rd of this year. They're all important decisions. But I think the most important political decision ever made was made on a mountaintop 2,000 years ago. And today I'd like us to focus in on that particular decision and its implications for this nation and for our lives. When Jesus began his ministry, the Gospel of Matthew tells us that the Spirit of God led Jesus into the wilderness where he would spend 40 days and 40 nights in prayer and fasting. And during these 40 days, he faced his greatest temptations, which are also our greatest temptations. And the one temptation that I'd like us to focus in on today is the third and final of the temptations that he faced. It's found in the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Then the devil brought Jesus to a very high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Now let's pause here for a moment and consider this picture. I mean, this is something that we cannot see in just a few seconds. I mean, think of this view, all the kingdoms of the world. I mean, not just his hometown of Nazareth or the capital city of Jerusalem or the territory between the two. I mean, this would include Rome and the entire Roman Empire, the continents of Europe, Asia, and Africa, and even North and South America that no one even knew existed at that point. I mean, look, Jesus, all the kingdoms of the world... And the devil said, I'll give you all these if you will bow down and worship me. Now, just a word about the devil. You know, many of us have this uh, picture of the devil that's almost cartoonish. It's uh, uh, horns and a goatee. 
uh, a tail, uh, maybe all red, uh, carrying a fit pitchfork. And I've got to say that, that, that if I saw a character that looked like that, that's not going to be temptation for me because I'm going to be turning and running in the opposite direction as fast as I can. The Bible never describes the devil as a physical being, but as a spiritual force. Never more powerful than God. But, but, but wanting to, to lead us uh, away from God and, and away from what God wants for us, often described as the tempter. Now, a few weeks ago when, when uh, we looked at temptation, I, I said that most often I experience temptation as this voice in my head or this nudge to do what is in my own best interest even when it's not what God wants for me. So here we have Jesus and his wisdom and and character. And we have all the kingdoms of the world in their neediness and brokenness. And Matthew tells us that, that in this moment... Jesus is offered something that seems like a good deal to me. I mean, wouldn't we want to live in a world, uh, wouldn't we want to live in a nation where where Jesus was in control? A world where Jesus was in control. Jesus, uh, uh, North Korea led by Jesus. Uh, China led by Jesus. Syria led by Jesus. Even the United States led by Jesus. I mean, wouldn't we want to live in that kind of world? I mean, just think of how much easier our decision would be at this election if Jesus was one of the candidates on the ballot. Now, let me be clear. Jesus is not one of the candidates on the ballot, and neither is the devil. But what if Jesus were running the country? I mean, there... There would be no more stalemates in, in uh, Congress. I mean, no more bickering. Jesus would find a way to overcome that. I mean, tax relief from heaven. Uh, instead of the internal revenue service, we'd have the eternal revenue service. I mean, no need for a Supreme Court. I mean, what if Jesus were the head of the Environmental Protection Agency? or he was in charge of the Pentagon, there would be no weapons of mass destruction anywhere. And kingdoms are not only governments. Kingdoms are systems of power, and there are all kinds of systems of power. There are educational systems and workplace systems and, and health care systems. There are systems after systems after systems. All systems, all kingdoms under the power and control and authority of Jesus. And, and Matthew was telling us that there was this moment in which Jesus was given the option to be in control of all of this. And I'm thinking, Jesus, do it. I mean, come on, Jesus, please do it. But he says, no. He rejects the power. He says, go away, Satan. Because it's written, you will worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Jesus rejects the power because he knows that there is something greater than power and he chooses a different way. See, when God sent, God sent Jesus into this world as a defenseless child to show us humility and servanthood and vulnerability and love. 
And I think when Jesus stood on that mountaintop 2,000 years ago and said no to power, that was the most important political decision ever made to choose a different way. And that vision, that vision of God's kingdom, offers hope that no other kingdom has ever offered. And as we look toward this year's election, how do the policies and party platforms and candidates line up with the values of God's kingdom? How do my politics and where I send my money and how I vote, how does that reflect the, the, the values that, that I see in the life of Jesus? You know, many years ago, uh, Chuck Colson wrote a book entitled Kingdoms in Conflict. Now, if you don't recognize the name, uh, Chuck Colson was President Richard Nixon's special counsel who got into trouble uh, for obstruction of justice during the Watergate investigation. This was in 1974. He was found guilty and sent to federal prison for seven months. And just before he went off to prison, he became a Christian. He, he gave his life to Christ. And he would go on to launch a prison fellowship, which is a ministry that, that provides assistance to, to uh, prisoners, ex-prisoners and their family. And he died a few years ago, but he, he'd written uh, at least two dozen books uh, about the Christian faith. I don't agree with him about everything that he says, but, but I value his thoughtful perspective and the ministry that he launched. And in his book, he says this, there will by nature be a conflict between the kingdoms of this world and the kingdom of God. There will be times when these kingdoms collide. And he goes on to describe a few examples. One of those examples was Nazi Germany. 90% of Germans identified as Christians in 1933 when Hitler was elected. 90%. I mean, how can you say that you were a follower of Jesus, that you were embracing the values of God's kingdom, the values that, that, that Jesus gave us through his life? I mean, how can you say that you are a follower of Jesus and then conquer surrounding nations. And if you can find a way to justify that, well, well, how can you justify the treatment of Jews as, as somehow subhuman if you are following God's kingdom values? There must be some disconnect between faith and what Jesus was saying on that mountaintop, and politics, and, and how people are being treated. Because how can you say that you were a follower of Jesus, that you were embracing God's kingdom values, and then take property away from Jews, and, and force them into ghettos, and, and then arrest them, and, and take them to concentration camps, force them into gas chambers, and then cremate their bodies so that there is no evidence that they ever existed on the face of this earth. I mean, there must be some disconnect. See, whether we are Republicans or Democrats, conservatives or progressives, 
how do the values that we see in the life of Jesus line up with, with, with policies and, and platforms and the candidates that we support? See, both Republicans and Democrats, look at the world and then try to work together for the common good. I mean, conservatives do this, uh, progressives do this. They look at some problem that exists in this world and then they try to come together for the common good. If you happen to be watching the presidential debate on Thursday night, you saw some of this. I mean, there were points where, where, where both candidates were addressing the same problem, were asked to address the same problem, and their approach to that was, was quite different. I mean, Republicans see the role of government one way, Democrats see the role of government another way, conservatives one way, progressives another way. And that's okay. As long as we are seeing the problem. And doing something. So you cannot say that faith does not have anything to do with politics. Because faith has everything to do with politics. Faith, faith is what, what helps us see the brokenness that exists in this world. Faith is what compels us to, 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 to do something in, in the way in which Jesus lived. You know, I'm continually reminded of the words of the Apostle Paul, who I think summarizes this way of Jesus in, in his letter to the Colossians. He wrote, therefore. If you remember, I've said in the past that whenever we see the word therefore in Scripture, we are to stop and to consider what's it there for. And what, what, what Paul has just done is describe what God has done for us. And, and how if we are following in the way of Jesus, we, we are turning away from, from values that are not consistent with who Jesus is. Values that, that, will, that, that will pull us away from God. And so he's saying, therefore, as God's choice, holy and loved. What are we to do? What values are we to put into our lives? Put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Be tolerant with each other. And if someone has a complaint against anyone, forgive each other. As the Lord forgave you, so also forgive each other. And then don't miss this verse. For over all these things put on love which is the perfect bond of unity. See, love is so much more than an emotion. Love is greater than power. It's the way of Jesus. And that way has never and will never fail us. Last week, I came across the story of Emma Daniel Gray. Her story was featured in a past issue of the Washington Post. She died in 2009 at the age of 95. And for 24 years, she worked in the White House, and her job was to clean the Oval Office. I mean, here's a picture of Emma uh, in 1979 when she retired. Uh, Jimmy Carter was the president then. Uh, she served uh, six different presidents. Beginning in 1955, when Dwight Eisenhower was the president. Now, she was a Christian. And she worked nights dusting, vacuuming, taking out the trash. 
But the last thing she would do before she turned out the lights and went home was she would stand behind the president's chair, place her hands on the chair, and she would pray. Lord, bless the man who occupies this chair. He needs your help. Guide him and direct him and bring good into his life. Take care of him. She said she didn't necessarily vote for every man who occupied that chair. Some didn't uh, support civil rights the way she thought they should. But she always cared for them. And she always prayed for them. At her funeral, the preacher said that she was someone who who always looked for the good in, in people. She, she was someone who was always, uh, always optimistic, always saw the opportunities in people. And for each president, she, 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 uh, she, she saw what, 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 what they could be and should be with God's help. And he said, she preached her eulogy in the way she lived her life. On November the 4th, or it may be a few days later or even a few days later until we know who the president will be for the next four years. Some people will be happy, some will be angry, and many will be indifferent. But as a people who have pledged our allegiance to God's kingdom, let us pray for the best and stand up for the values that we see in the life of Jesus. Because regardless of who the next president will be, there is work for us to do for the sake of Jesus Christ and the life to which we are called. Let's pray. Oh God, how grateful we are for your love and care, for your forgiveness and grace. We need you. You know how contentious this election season is and how divided we are as a nation. Help us to align our opinions and words and actions with the way you showed us to live. Give us the wisdom we need to know what to do and the courage to do it. For we offer ourselves once again to you, in Jesus' name, amen.